Hi, and welcome to Let's Talk AppSec Ops. My name is Mark Lambert, Chief Product Officer at Armacode. I'm joined by my good friend, Luis Guzman. Luis, how are you doing? Doing excellent. How are we're, you? We're back into Zoom land after, yeah. you know, coming off a great week at RSAC 2023. And, you know, coming straight out of that, we're looking at the next big event, which will be AppSec Con in June. Mm -hmm. uh, Last year, we hosted AppSecCon, uh, over 2,200 registrars, uh, registrations. Um, it was a uh, total of 40-something speakers. Um, really great virtual conference. I suggest you check out the uh, recorded sessions. They're available on YouTube. They'll, we'll put them in the show notes below. But one topic that we covered during AppSecCon last year, and we're going to repeat it this year, is the state of application security operations report. So we ran that last year um, and we've just launched the new version. Again, check the show notes. You'll be able to click on and take the survey. If you take the survey, you'll have a chance to win uh, one of, I think it's five or so or $100 gift cards. Um, um, and also you'll be able to access last year's report. So Here's the interesting thing. When you run a report multiple years in a row, you get to start seeing trends. But let's take a step back, right, Luis? Let's, let's look at what we did last year. Um, and uh, as I said, there was a session presented. You can download the results. Um, and it was a really interesting report that we ran. It was. And I think one of the, the big aha moments for me was how many people responded and their responses to those were they seemed very transparent so um for whatever reason how how we set it up was really conversational that people wanted to talk about what was going on um, yeah so yeah we, we had over 500 respondents um um covering both security and development so you know really kind of like and also leaders and practitioners which gave us a great set of data that we could segment. Um, certainly when we were looking at the demographics, there were a lot of people that were mature, but you can kind of split them into three key bucket areas. Those which are count themselves as mature, somewhat mature, and three and just starting. So again, we got a good distribution of that. And, and one of the key things that jumped out is that organizations still have unmanaged risk in their portfolio. So it's getting out into production. It's not not a problem that you have risk. We all have risk. The problem is whether or not it's managed. Yeah. And and then the, I think the the questions on there, being able to understand that unmanaged risk, right? What is that unmanaged risk? What is, a, you know, how often do critical or high severities get out there, right? That that was a question that was on there. Um, so it was really interesting how they responded. Do, do you want to, you know, give it a little bit more light to that? Yeah, so so when we looked at the data, we actually try to categorize what a leader looked like. So, you know, pulling out that, you know, where do they rate themselves on the maturity, but also understanding how well they're handling or managing that risk. So, you know, how often do vulnerabilities make their way into production? And certainly when we look at the audience there, we define a leader as that they never released a critical vulnerability into production and never or rarely released a high. And that only represented about 7%, a little over 7% of the audience. What was shocking when we looked at that is that over 25% of the audience, you know, either it was in every release that they were pushing criticals and highs out, or they didn't actually even know, which is kind of like one of those even scarier things, I think. Well, that right there that you don't know, that's what we talk about in visibility all the time. It's like, this is a real pillar of what you're going to try to do in your environment is, can you see it? Do you know? Are you being alerted? Is there a monitoring mechanism? No visibility, then you have no idea what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you have to you know, we've got this big push to release software quicker, right? We, we, we know this, we live this, you know, you know, we, when we talk about, you know, the presentation I delivered at RSA last year, uh, last year, last week, last week. Um, uh, was all about kind of like how software delivery has changed. And, and mm -hmm. certainly the, the data in last year's report also demonstrated the same thing. You know, um, over 60% agreed that shipping fast takes priority over shipping secure. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, how do we, put mitigations in place, controls in place, so that we can kind of like mitigate that risk. And obviously, one of the things that we could potentially do is slow down releases. 
But what we identified there was actually there's a there's a juxtaposition there because if I slow down the release, I don't have the ability to respond to zero days. Mm -hmm. So that sweet spot seems to be last year, every two weeks was the release right. cadence, right? If we look at the leaders, they were kind of like releasing every two weeks. It's going to be really interesting to see how that has evolved as we move forward this year. I can pontificate. I can I can guess, right? I can future cast that it's going to stay around the same or it might have even gone up. I think it's going to have gone up. Um, I think the 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 usual the traditional waterfall centric um even though you know agile-ish whatever we want to call it you know like hey i'm going to gate the pipeline right i'm going to you know the ability for me to be able to respond is i have to slow things down that doesn't work because of the zero days again right. secure is not a point in time anymore um and the, what we have to do is reduce that feedback loop so another interesting thing that came out um was that the number one initiative to really manage that risk is to put tools into the pipeline. Um, you know, that was by far the, the most common practice um, that organizations were facing. Um, and there was a whole bunch of different tools that people used. Um, we also clearly saw that the industry has shifted from a portfolio based tool approach, meaning I'm going to buy everything from one vendor to saying, I need a highly distributed best of breed approach. I'm going to pick the best tool for the best, you know, for the problem area. And, you know, that's driven by obviously looking for a kind of like the most accurate, the most rapid, the easiest one to use. It's also driven by just frankly, some tools are more appropriate for certain types of applications than others. And enabling the development team to self-select reduces the friction from a security perspective as well. And I think the the like the tool type, right? When we look at cloud security and containers, right? I I kind of put both of those together, even though I know we call it out in the report. But I actually think that when they're reporting on cloud security and container, you put both of those together, uh, and it becomes a higher number. It becomes the top uh, category when you put both of those in there because. I used to think it was bug bounty, right? Getting everybody from the outside to tell me, hey, these are the things that are wrong. But it's actually internally, these are the containers, the cloud that I'm actually using on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is more uh, risk prone in organizations right now than anything yeah. else. Yeah, and if I if I take that back a second, right? And I think about that, you know, it, looking at that data in hindsight, really that has really shown the thing that we've seen this year as as we've been we're talking with clients about this intersection between AppSec and Infra and these two worlds coming together. I mean like the rise of CNAP, right, is a good a, a good good indicator of that. While that really only helps us in a truly cloud native world, um, you know, that that concept of unifying AppSec and vulnerability management together is ubiquitous. It's it's it's, it's certainly the primary driver. Um, and you know, how we we do that is we're using these tools and these tools become somewhat interchangeable. It's the process that's the most important thing. How do I bring them together? How do I unify that process? And how do I scale it across my organization? So we actually asked about security champions last year, and that seemed to be a significant practice within organizations. Um, I actually expect that number to go up more. I think that the definition of security champion has somewhat evolved, um, uh, but I do see that security champions is uh, you know a key element to maturing your your application security program. I think that security champion role is actually going to be what I would consider a tier one entry level role now, because you could get a lot of the the kids coming out of school that are fresh, you know, uh, you know, fresh set of eyes to be able to say, hey guys there might be a faster way to do this. There might be a faster way to collaborate between teams. And because we have a lot of Gen Xers and Gen Zers and, you know, millennials all mixed into the crowd, uh, you know, having a fresh set of eyes is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, that that's you, when we concluded the report, right, we, we looked at what the top three challenges were and the focuses for the next 12 months. So it's good. Again, it's going to be interesting to see with the progress we've made on that, but certainly, you know, the interesting thing was that they kind of aligned. So, mm -hmm. you know, the number one challenge was hiring qualified application security engineers. The number one um, focus was automation of, of the workflow. So, you know, if I can't find all the people, let me automate the mundane stuff so I can enable the people that I have to be more productive. 
Yep. Second exactly. thing was disconnected systems and processes, right? So the interesting thing was like a lot of people said that they had the data that they needed to be able to communicate their risk position to the organization, but they also expressed that they were going to be focusing on visibility of their application security posture. So lots of data, but not so much visibility. And that mm -hmm. disconnected systems is that is the number one challenge. Again, it's the tools are interchangeable. It's the process that's important. So obviously, this is what we focus on in, 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 as an organization. And then that third thing was poor collaboration between the teams and, and focusing on better collaboration between security and development. I, I like what you just said about bring in a new set of eyes in. I think the, the security champions model, identifying those which are more intrinsically motivated to do things around security and become that advocate. Um, and certainly this is an area where I've seen kind of like organizations looking at that, hey, um, it's a partnership, right? You know, mm -hmm. I, I've actually had some security teams say that the development of the team is their customer. Um, and uh, But I really think it's really a partnership because Security's job is to inform the business and assist with prioritization. So we're doing the best things possible to mitigate the risk and while not disrupting the development team as much. Um, so keeping them focused on delivering functionality to the business, but in the most safe way possible. Yeah. I mean, if you make hamburgers, you want to keep making hamburgers. Otherwise, you can't make money. You always talk about hamburgers when it's my lunchtime. Do you realize <laughs> that? Um, so, I love it. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Well, I, you know, I think you. I, I think this is a great profile of the of last year's. As I said, check out the show notes for um, AppSecCon recordings from last year. Uh, check out the show notes to get access to the report from last year. But more importantly, check out the link to go ahead and um, you know submit for this year for a chance to win uh, an Amazon gift card. Um, definitely, you know, your, your input is critical. You know, we want to make sure that we have a good sizable view across the industry. Um, over 500 people submitting last year, which is a great starting point, um, and really st becomes statistically uh, significant at that point. So with that being said, I, this one's a wrap, Luis. That's it. Let's get a thousand for this new one. Boom, boom, boom. All right. There you go. Set, setting the goals. I like it. All right, everybody, thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned for the next episode. Click like, subscribe, um, and then go ahead and, and check out the survey. Take care. Be safe. All right, bye.